Chapter 12, Part 2. We're still in the north of Europe and we're still going to be looking at some first generation panel painters. And I'm, I made the break right here because our next panel painter is very significant. And you do need to know his name. This is Jan van Eyck. <clears throat> this portrait on the right is thought to be a self-portrait of Jan van Eyck. He was the court painter to Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy. Jan also worked for patrons in the Low Countries. The Low Countries are the Netherlands and Belgium. So um, there's how he regarded himself. And you can see one aspect of the northern painters that we have seen with the first generation panel painters is this, this love of detail, this great desire to reproduce the observed world in fine detail, not just to include symbols, but to really paint well. So this is uh, this huge piece of Jan van Eyck and most possibly his brother Hubert as well. And this is called the Ghent Altarpiece. I put it in red because I will ask you where it is. It's a quiz question. One of his Jan van Eyck's most famous works was a polyptic, meaning many panels, for the Cathedral of Simbavo in Ghent, Flanders. <clears throat> Closed, its colors were muted and sober. When it opened on Sundays and feast days, it was vibrantly colored. So we'll look at all of this. We'll look at the closed uh, state, which is right here, and we will look at um, the open state. So I happen to really love the closed state, maybe more than the open state. I love certain parts of it. Anyway, uh, a couple of things to point out that there are two main registers here. The lower register has these little niches, and two of the niches are filled with sculpture. These are just the patron saints of the patrons, and the patrons are shown in the outer niches praying to their saints. But this whole thing is paint, obviously. It's um, oil paint, oil on panel. So here's um, some of this rich detail, this rich modeling and by a superb artist here. The upper reach is just a group of small little vignettes of uh, prophets and sibyls, people who came before Jesus predicting the birth of Jesus. And then the center register is my favorite. So these four panels here all, sub, uh, all, all create one big scene. Let's look at that. And the iconography in here is very similar to what we just saw from the Master of Flamal in part one. And this is the Annunciation. So there are so many similarities. Look at the beautiful wings on the angels, the, the flowing white gown, the angel personified as a human, uh, a beautiful human that's kind of androgynous, uh, appears to marry. Uh, this Mary's in a white gown and not the, the red gown of the other. And she's also reading, and she hasn't realized that Gabriel's there. Uh, this Mary, though, has a dove falling down on her head. So that represents the Holy Spirit. This is a little bit, much, a little bit. It's a much better JPEG. Um, so this Mary, her eyes kind of gazing upward. It looks like she's... Um, saying something this is what she's saying so upside down is her speech she's saying uh, i am the the handmaid of the lord a chanchilla domine and i think it's made upside down because it was what she said to god and god is envisioned as being up so it's all about god look at the the beautiful modeling of this drapery. It's just astounding how uh, this artist in a very small period very smoothly and effortlessly goes from very light to very dark. So you can just marvel over this gorgeous painting. Then, uh, oh, and back here in this niche is a gleaming, shining vessel, just like we saw in the Moroda altarpiece. And here is a blue and white cloth hanging up next to the gleaming vessel. So you're getting this. It was, it was a well 
familiar vocabulary of symbols. So the artist would put all this here, the viewers would see it, and they would um, understand because it was seen frequently. Now, my favorite bit about this, I will constantly show you what I like and what I find interesting about everything, is uh, this four panel scene here. Jan van Eyck wanted to create the illusion that you and I, the viewers, are actually looking through windows into a room in a house, and in an upstairs room as well. So he did this by painting shadows here, suggesting that these are actual window frames and we're outside where the sun is and the sun is creating this shadow in here. This is just illusion. This is not a real cast shadow. It is Jan van Eyck's masterly touch. Don't you love that? I hope you do. It's very cool. Um, and here's just another detail showing the view of the city. I mean, he did not need to do this. He could have just had a, a tree outside, but no, no. He painted the city, and it looks like he's doing some work with linear perspective, which we also see in this room. He's getting good at it. Yeah, I don't see any problems with his perspective. And here's the open, the open state of the Ghent altar piece. This is how the worshipers in, in the Sambhava Cathedral would see it on feast days. So normally it was closed and, and the people coming would just see the Annunciation on ordinary weekdays. But perhaps on Sundays, definitely on feast days like Easter and Christmas, this would be open and um, any major feast that had to do with Jesus or Mary, um, it would be open. So this, like, look at all these different panels. It's also thought that there might be some missing panels. And this is because during wars, like World War II, when the Nazis occupied Belgium, uh, this was taken apart and the panels were removed from the cathedral and hidden in various people's attics and basements so that the Nazis could not take them and loot them. Um, and then after the war, after the defeat of the Nazis, it was reassembled, but it's thought that there's a, some belief that it's missing something. I don't know what the missing bits would be, but that's what it is. So this would have been the backdrop for the mass, and it, it does uh, contain a lot of information about the mass and its significance and the whole sort of theological statement of the creation and the purpose of Jesus coming. So bear with me. I'm just going to, to spell it out and you can, you can get it, I hope. So on these two side panels, we've got Adam and Eve who were, uh, according to the Hebrew scriptures, they were the first humans created by God. And uh, I, just a side note, I always find it amusing when they have belly buttons. Um, because they, they were not born. Up in these little quarter circles above their heads, we have these grisaille or fake sculpture representations of the murder of Abel. So Cain, who was, uh, one, who was their son, murdered another of their sons, Abel. So that's kind of the fall. So Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They've already, sh they're shown here being shamed. They were expelled from the garden. So in church theology, it was their sin that caused all subsequent human beings to be born into sin, and only Jesus can release people from that condemnation by his blood, his blood sacrifice. Um, so, okay, that was, that was a lot. Um, so that's what what we're seeing, the start of the story, the sin, and now the rest of the story, the salvation. So registers is the upper register and the lower register. All of these panels in the lower register comprise one single scene, and this is all the adoration of the mystic lamb. And in fact, this, this uh, altarpiece is often referred to as the adoration of the mystic lamb. But let's look at the upper register too, because I think it's kind of interesting. So the center 
of the upper register is uh, something that will offend some of my students, and I'm sorry again. Um, this is God the Father seated on the throne of heaven. He's uh, envisioned as a male, a white male, sitting on a throne with a triple tiara and um, a beard. <laughs> To his right is the Virgin Mary, who sits as the Queen of Heaven, and she's already got a crown. This is, uh, this is also iconography that appears during the Gothic period as Mary, the Queen of Heaven. I didn't show you any examples, but there are a lot of them. On his left is John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus. He's the man who came and said uh, that Jesus was coming immediately knew Jesus. On either side of them, we've got angels, an angel choir on this side, and an angel organist. Now, I think I've got some details. Let's see. Yeah. So here's the angel choir on one side. It, I, you've got to love this. So it's a, they, I, they may not even be angels. It may just be a heavenly choir because I don't see the usual signifiers of angels. Anyway, you've got a group of people singing, but they don't look real happy. I mean, look at this person here. Um, they don't look like they're overjoyed to be in the presence of um, Mary or God. They just look kind of bored, like my mom made me join this choir. And then the Virgin Mary is absolutely gorgeous. If you look at her and compare her to the one we saw in the Annunciation scene, this one... Um, because her eyes are closed, she's not looking kind of sickly, gazing towards heaven. She's also wearing her signature blue gown, beautiful crown, beautiful face. Everything about the Virgin Mary is stunningly gorgeous. And she's still reading a book. So in the lower section now, um, all of those side panels just show various crowds. It, it's basically illustrating that the whole world is coming to adore Jesus, uh, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And Jesus here is represented as the lamb on this altar. So this also has to do with theology that... Uh, comparing Jesus to a sacrificial lamb whose blood had to be shed uh, to expunge sin. So here's Jesus as the lamb with a halo radiating out from his head. Blood is actually coming from a wound in his chest and is falling into this chalice on the altar. So that reminds all viewers that his blood is memorialized in the communion or the Eucharist of the Last Supper that's part of every Mass in church. Up above Jesus in the sky is the dove, the dove of the Holy Spirit. So anytime you see a dove, it represents the Holy Spirit. Let's go back. I want to show you something else. We have this alignment in the center panels. From God the Father here, um, right down at God the Father's feet, there's a crown sitting on the, the floor. It's an empty crown. It's, it's the crown for Jesus when Jesus comes up here into heaven. So then we have the Holy Spirit. So God the Father, God the Holy Spirit is the dove, and God the Son there on the altar is the lamb. And right below that is your entry point. This is what it symbolizes. I'm just telling you... Um, it's an eight-sided fountain. This is the fountain of baptism and saying that you can come to this altar. You can drink this life-giving blood if you pass through baptism. If you're baptized, you can come in there and participate. So it's, it's extremely complex. Now, enough of that. Here's a secular painting, one that uh, is just purely, purely secular, secular. And it is also loaded with symbols, and it is done by the same artist who did that gilt altarpiece. So Jan's best-known painting is a double portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife, Giovanna. His signature is inscribed above the mirror on the back wall. And it's small painting. It's very small, so get a sense of the height of it. It's a little under a yard tall. 
Um, and it's a, it's a domestic interior, meaning it shows their, the inside of their home. This is their bed back here. And all these little details in the painting. I've got several details to show you, but I also have a list of the details and what they all mean. So, um, over here, there's a pair of shoes that have been removed. This represents the fact that this is a holy event, meaning that it's a sacrament. In the Catholic Church, marriage is a sacrament. So a sacrament is occurring here. Um, there's a candle, a single candle up here in this, uh, right there is the one candle. The rest of the, the candle holders are empty. And... Um, it, I just have a note that this is a Flemish custom and represents the light of the world. It's not without religion. I mean, everybody's religious. It's everywhere. So, um, but it's not a devotional piece. The mirror in the back, I will show you the detail of that later. Um, and the dog in the foreground represents fidelity like a dog is faithful a dog is faithful to his master so often dogs appear around spouses because it represents that faithfulness of one to the other and it's a wish for that um let's see the the joining of their hands here represents marriage across class lines where I believe he's the merchant. She might be a little bit higher class. I'm not sure what the difference was here. Sorry. Uh, there's apples sitting on the windowsill. I'll show you those. They represent the Garden of Eden. And uh, I've got a few, few more um, symbols to show you. But before we zoom in on those, a lot of people think that she looks pregnant here. And I... My belief is that she is not pregnant, but this is a wish for, for fertility for children in the marriage. And so she's sort of symbolizing that by lifting up her skirt, also a little bit suggestive, and then uh, gathering it over her stomach. So here's one of the details I said, the apples on the windowsill that have sort of a double meaning. They remind us of the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but also symbolize fertility. And back here on this chair, there's a carving. I know it's very difficult to see, so you have to take my word for it, that there's a figure, um, a woman, and she is emerging from a dragon, which you can kind of see the dragon's body there. Um, you could probably find a better image if you Google that. This is St. Margaret of Antioch. St. Margaret of Antioch is the patron saint of childbirth. So I'm, I'm going to show you more of her because she does appear several times. Childbirth was a very dangerous procedure in these times where many babies and many mothers died during childbirth. So it was always a good thing to pray for a safe delivery. And uh, St. Margaret of Antioch becomes the saint that you pray to for that. And she was, the reason she's the patron saint is because her story has her being swallowed by a dragon and then, uh, but alive. So she's not chewed up. She's just swallowed whole. She prays to God while she's in the dragon's stomach and God releases her from the stomach. It's sort of, the dragon kind of explodes and out comes Margaret of Antioch alive to tell her story. So you, I think you should see the connection that she comes alive out of the center of another creature. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Too much information? Um, and this is absolutely stunning. So now you have to keep in mind the size of this is this, I said it was a little under a yard high, so maybe this mirror altogether is about five inches. So that means each one of these little roundels is less than an inch. And Jan van Eyck has painted inside of each circle a scene from the Stations of the Cross. 
So there's a little scene and there's really figures in here. And if you could go to this art gallery and stand very close to it, you could tell what they all were. Um, I'm just going to say the very top one is the crucifixion. So you can kind of see Jesus on the cross there. So that's amazing. He also creates this convex mirror in the center and depicts the entire room in reverse in sort of a fisheye lens. And here's uh, the two main figures, the bride and groom, with their backs to us. So we see their backs. There's the light fixture. There's the window, the apples on the bench. But he shows us the doorway at the far end, the one where the artist is standing. And in fact, he shows us two figures standing in the doorway that include him, a self-portrait, and some other person as the witness. So they're... Uh, Marriages, like today, require two legal witnesses to the event. And then to verify that he witnessed it, he signed his name on the wall. And it has the date and says, uh, Johannes de Eich Fuitich. There you go. Now, now you've enjoyed a lot of Jan van Eyck and the Maroda altarpiece. So that's all first generation panel painters. So panel painting continues and um, a lot of painters are working on a lot of pieces in Flanders. So we're not going to look at all of them. But we will look at this one. Um, we know this artist is Roger van der Weyden and he's considered second generation panel painters which means that he's going to continue working in this new medium of oil, but he's not going to load his painting up with symbols. So that's the main difference here, that there's more emphasis on the narration, the drama of the actual scene, um, the subject matter, than there is in these all these symbols. So... Um, he was possibly apprenticed to the artist who did the Maroda altarpiece, but we don't know. So this deposition here was commissioned by the Crossbowmen's Guild. Um, I think it's, you know, I want to point out all the things that are interesting to me. So first of all, you notice the sumptuous painting, the beautiful color, the depth of this blue, this glazing, um, this man here wearing this brocade cloak that is so beautifully painted, so detailed. Then there's a lot of strange things about it. And you've probably already observed the fact that that's not how you imagine that cross to be. And that's because this is a like a, uh, a, a uh, I'm trying to think what the name of it is. <laughs> A uh, tableau vivant. It's like a group of actors posing. And it's also not a crucifixion scene like you imagined. The cross should be out on a hillside with the sky and the countryside behind it. And instead, it looks like it's occurring inside of this little niche, this wooden niche with uh, shading and little corner brackets. So the the Crossbowman's Guild even has like little bows represented here in these wood things. That's that's minor. Other things happening here. Um, I look at the angle of Jesus, the dead body. He's being removed from the cross um, dead. It's called the iconography. It's called the deposition, and Mary is also in this angle, and this represents the dogma from the Catholic Church of the co-passion. And this was where the story of Mary becomes so elevated. Her role in the story of Jesus is so emphasized that um, it's believed that at the time Jesus was crucified, every pain he suffered, Mary also suffered. So when he was beaten and tortured, Mary felt every stroke, every piercing. When he was on the cross, she felt it all. When he died, Mary fainted. So this 
this dogma is illustrated by the angles, by Mary's diagonal and Jesus' diagonal. Normally, crucifixions, we see Mary standing and acting very sad and weeping or holding Jesus' body. But when you see this parallelism, this is, uh, that's what's going on. And the skull down here, um, because this is the place of the skulls, the skull could be the skull of Adam. And there's so much happening here. I think also that this is uh, painted to represent or to take the place of carved altar pieces. And I'm going to show you some of those a little bit later. So carved wooden altar pieces are a very common occurrence too in this and in Germany, in Flanders and Germany. Here's another secular secular painting. This is by an artist named Petrus Christus, and he shows a goldsmith in his shop. So he shows this um, merchant with the things that he sells, the tools of his trade, and a couple of customers here also in elaborately painted uh, gowns and amazing hat. Here's a piece of coral on his shelf back here. This has also been interpreted as having some religious meaning, but I just like to see it as a secular, almost a genre scene, just everyday life, people visiting the jeweler's shop. Notice this convex mirror because apparently they were popular. And um, here's another Petrus Christus that I like to include to show you that a lot of the things we saw in the Jan van Eyck marriage portrait um, seem to be just ordinary everyday house things. So the even the drapery on the bed is the same over here. Uh, this Mary has a carved chair here also with Margaret of Antioch. There's the same sort of uh, candle holder. There's a window with apples on it. Uh, this is obviously a sacred painting of the Holy Family. So it's Mary with a really weird looking baby Jesus. Uh, Petrus Christus illustrating his understanding of linear perspective. Joseph is an old man walking in the back door. So I've been just giving you a huge vocabulary of the symbols, the symbolic um, language of Christian art. Hope you're um, enjoying it. <laughs> so there's more. There's more. This is a painting by Hugo van der Ross. The Portinari altarpiece is infused with symbolic meaning, including a wheat sheaf, majolica, and flowers. Portraits of the Portinari children are sensitive renderings of youthful faces that were unusual for the time. This triptych was placed in a church in Florence, Italy. I think that's that's important. I have a lot of details of this one as well. Um, so this is an adoration of the shepherds. That's the main subject of the center panel, the adoration of the shepherds. This was one of the first events after the birth of Jesus, and the shepherds came in from the fields and worshipped him. So um, this is the center panel again. These are the shepherds here. This is famous today because it depicts the shepherds as kind of rough uh, peasant types, kind of dirty, scraggly, like they've been out living in, in the rough with their sheep and then they just came into civilization and um, are here to witness this. Notice Joseph, old man. Uh, sandal off, holy event, wheat sheep here. I forget what that's all about. I think it might be symbolizing the communion, but I'm not real sure. Um, and this is interesting. It's the newborn baby Jesus on the ground laying on some straw. So I get to tell you the story. I, I love to narrate these odd little stories of uh, these Christian legends. But this is a legend. Um, it came from the St. Bridget of Sweden, who was a nun, and she lived in Sweden. She had a vision, a vision about the birth of baby Jesus. And in her vision, she saw, she saw the Virgin Mary in the stable pregnant, and she was in labor. 
and everybody left the stable. She asked everybody to leave, so she was all alone in there and uh, prayed to God for uh, delivery of her baby. And then a miracle occurred, and the baby was removed from her body without passing through the birth canal. So it was like she was beamed out of Mary. I mean, sorry, he was beamed out of Mary. And so Mary didn't, like her pain just suddenly stopped and there was a baby. And in the vision, Bridget saw this as uh, the baby Jesus at one moment just appeared on a bed of straw in the stable. And so that's why when you see pictures of Mary with baby Jesus on the floor on straw, this is what it represents, is the, the vision of St. Bridget. Nobody questioned that. Everybody believed it. And you know what? It also preserves her virginity because um, birth can be quite disruptive to the female anatomy. But Mary was spared that. So she's still technically a very pure, clean vessel. Okay? And nothing's going to happen because there's old man Joseph. This painting was painted in oil and purchased by an Italian man who took it to Florence, Italy and placed it in a church in Florence where the Italian artists saw the beautiful colors that were achieved with this new medium and they started getting interested in oil paint because of this. So I think it's a very important painting, um, more for the medium. These are the two side panels that show the um, the family, the Portinari family. These are their patron saints, shown really large, and this is hierarchic scale. Here's the father of the family, shown smaller, the mother of the family here, and the two sons and the one daughter over here. So the the text slide that we saw commented on the, the depiction of these children's faces, that it was kind of rare to actually see children. Now, I told you I was going to show you more of Margaret of Antioch, and this is her. So the woman who was miraculously delivered from the belly of the dragon, here she is again, and here's the dragon's head down under her feet. So anytime you see a woman with a dragon, it's Margaret. This is Mary Magdalene. Her attribute, the way to identify her is with this uh, alabaster jar that she holds, so um, and the men on the left, I could identify them, but I won't. In the background here, we have the approach of the Magi. So this is on the right-hand side, and it shows the procession of the Magi coming close to the stable. And on the left, we have um, Mary and Joseph on their approach to Bethlehem. So it's kind of like a sequence here where we've got uh, the holy couple coming to Bethlehem, then the center panel, which I've cut out of this, showing the adoration of the shepherds. And on the right panel, we've got the next event, which is the Magi coming. <clears throat> so just a, a couple of slides to point out. Tapestries were also an art form. We're not really going to talk about these very much, but they're in the book, and I didn't want you to think they weren't, but they get very elaborate. We saw in the the uh, Book of Hours of Jean-Duc de Berry, that he had a big, huge tapestry in the back of his feasting room. And uh, this is the story of the unicorn. So here's the unicorn down here, a very popular subject as well. Uh, it has religious symbolism, but it's mostly a secular scenes that have to do with the unicorn. And here's the unicorn captured sitting behind a fence. This style of uh, tapestry is called Mille Fiore because it's got a thousand flowers. That's what Mille Fiore means. Now, here's a very big idea, which is why it's in red, and it means it will show up on your quiz, is paper and printmaking occur at this time. So two big advances that changed the art scene in Europe. Art could be reproduced cheaply and sold at an affordable price and circulated widely. 
images and ideas spread rapidly. This is so new and it's going to change the art scene and the history of Europe because words as well as pictures can be circulated very rapidly using paper and printmaking. So the use of woodcuts for printmaking began to replace handwritten manuscripts. There's an early uh, printed book. So printing, exclamation point. The Nuremberg Chronicle was published in 1493 and contained, <laughs> it's hard to believe, 1,809 woodcut illustrations. I think that number must be a misprint. The panoramic city of Nuremberg uh, spread was painted by hand with color to enhance its appeal. So all the black lines are from a wood block where everything except the black lines was removed, was cut away from the wood, leaving only the black lines, and then it was printed. Then an artist came in with a paintbrush and filled in all the red roofs and the green grass and the blue roofs. So um, it's pretty labor intensive still. Here's what an uncolored plate from the Nuremberg Chronicles looked like. So again, Everything except the black lines was cut away from the wood block. And here's another illustration from the Nuremberg Chronicles showing that these artists, and I think there were several artists working on that, um, was working with linear perspective, trying to play with it and created this, this barrel vaulted interior space. <clears throat> so, uh, woodblock ha is, has its uh, downside. It's very difficult to get a lot of fine lines in woodblock. So engraving was a technique that allowed for finer lines and may have been developed by goldsmiths and armorers. The artist Martin Schongauer learned the technique from his father and produced The Temptation of St. Anthony. The moment is presented as a horrifying assault, but the saint shows no sign of torment due to his inner folk, due to his godliness. So this is the story of St. Anthony who lived as a hermit out in the desert of Egypt. And uh, he became famous during his lifetime. People would come visit him because he was so holy and everybody wanted some of that holiness to rub off on them. So it's almost like the veneration of relics, only you can get that benefit from visiting a living person as well. So he recorded his visions. A lot of these people had visions. And um, among them was the story that he was visited by demons who were tempting him to leave his desert and go into town and, and go to the tavern and have some beer and some uh, have a good time with other human beings. And he resisted. He See, he's a godly man, so he's showing his inner strength. The amazing thing here, though, is the craft of the print. So you can enjoy the, all these very fine lines, but also the bizarre imagination of Schongauer that envisions the demons in, in great detail with bizarre bodies. Uh, where does he get this stuff? I mean, they don't even look like real animals. This guy here looks like a a pure demon. He looks like something that will show up later as well. So this sort of thing was mass produced and people I guess wanted to be reminded of how horrible it was to uh, hang out with devils. Hmm. Here's another print that was made by an Italian artist, a classical sculptor inspire, inspired Antonio del Polaiolo's Battle of the Nude engraving. Um, it may have been intended to be a study of the human figure in action for other artists to use as a reference. That's my own theory. Muscles react under tension as figures fight against the tapestry-like background of foliage. So you can tell by looking at this that it is the same man. I mean, the same hairstyle, the same facial expression, and he's just been posed in different ways. So clearly the artist uh, had a model pose and sketched him and then he created this print probably with the idea of selling it to other artists who could use it as a reference tool when they had to have somebody make this pose. Oh. 
that's interesting. Here's an explanation of the, the techniques that we just looked at. So on the, re the relief method on the right, um, we're going to look at this first because this is the wood block and this is the one that you are most familiar with. So I said everything except the black lines had to be cut out. This is sort of a cross section of the wood block. So um, when the design is finished, then ink is placed on all the high parts and then it's applied to paper. This is just like rubber stamps. That's why it's really familiar to you and who hasn't used a rubber stamp where there's a high design, you put the ink on that or you stamp it with ink and then you press it on paper. So everything high comes onto your paper. And there shows the plate and the paper and those lines. The, the intaglio method is the opposite where you have a, a, a plate and you scratch little fine lines into it with a tool. So you can scrape out the metal, and it has to be metal, wood just would splinter. Um, so you scrape the lines, and you can draw just like those last two prints I showed you, so you can draw really fine lines. Then when you have finished your design and all your lines are just as you want them, you uh, rub ink over the whole plate, cover it completely with ink. Then you wipe off the high parts. So it's just the opposite of, of the relief printing. You wipe off the high, then you take a piece of paper that's slightly moist so it's flexible and you put it on top and you press it so that it, it squishes down into those little cracks and it will pick up the ink that is in all of these little cuts and scratches. And that's how you get intaglio prints. So there you are again. This is a wood block, a relief print, and this is the intaglio print. So you can see the difference in the many, many fine lines over here. So these are just some of the advances of art. Uh, paper and printmaking and oil painting, these are all things that happened in the early Renaissance in the north of Europe. And this brings us to the end of part two, chapter 12. And we're going to Italy next, so be sure to watch part three.